Hello, readers, and welcome to Read, the research and education advocacy podcast. Read connects you with researchers, educators, and thought leaders on topics in education and child development. Read is produced by the Windward Institute. I'm your host, Dr. Danielle Gomez, and in this episode, I invited Dr. Nina Saha for a conversation on translation to educational practice. In fact, Dr. Saha and I talked about not only translation, but implications for systems and the role of technology in social media. Trust me, I learned so much. And in fact, I had a lot of questions for Dr. Saha. So for those of you tuning in on YouTube, you may notice some outfit changes. And no, we did not change our outfit mid-conversation. We actually recorded across two time periods. So I want to thank Dr. Saha for offering your time. It was so generous to record this over a couple of days. And for those of you listening, you may hear some differences in audio, but no worries at all. That is just communicating my curiosity. So I invite you to be just as curious and to take some notes and learn along with me in this episode. I'll see you after the episode, readers. I am eager to introduce our guest for this month's episode, Dr. Nina Saha. Dr. Saha, welcome to the Read Podcast. Hi, thank you guys for having me. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. We are so happy to have you. I'm personally so happy to have you because there's so much that I want to talk to you about and learn from you. I'd like to know first, where are you in the world and how are you showing up to this conversation? Well, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. Technically, I'm in Cary. So if you're familiar with the area, it's just a little bit west of Raleigh. And I'm right now I'm consulting for a bunch of different companies and thinking about better ways to bridge this research to practice gap that we'll get into. So that's kind of how I'm showing up right now. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And when I first learned about your work, I've seen a number of of things that you have posted online for us as educators to learn from you and learn from the research. I was so lucky to see you in person a few months ago at the Reading Lead Conference, and it spawned so many thoughts and questions. And what I admire most about you is that I see you as a social entrepreneur in education, particularly in finding innovative methods to translate research to practice. And so I'm excited for our Read listeners to learn more about you. For those of you just learning about Dr. Saha, I'm going to read her formal bio, and then we'll dive into the conversation. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. Great. So Dr. Saha began her career in education as a classroom teacher for children with exceptional needs. She received her master's degree in educational neuroscience from Columbia University and her PhD in special education from Vanderbilt's Peabody College. Dr. Saha's doctoral work uh, resulted in a patent And you can also read a number of her um, journal articles and her work um, through uh, various journals and publications while at LMNO. LMNO or LMNO? Yeah, LMNO. You got it wrong. I love that. No, that's exactly what I thought about. But then I think when I was overthinking, I don't know, saying it. But anyways, LMNO. Love it. LMNO. She started (laughs) in the reading research recap. Another example of how innovative you are. Um, (laughs) Okay, so the Reading Research Recap, a newsletter aimed at translating research, recent research into useful information for teachers. Elemento was acquired by Metametrics in 2021 and joined her team to help build out their early literacy products, tools, and services. Dr. Saha left Metametrics full-time, she still consults, in 2023 and explores better ways of translating research at scale. I think over the last year, that's where I came into this identity as a connector of science and story. And I also see that as you as well of using tools that bridge the science and tell the story in a way that resonate with teachers. That's why I think things like in professional development, seeing models or seeing case studies of students who struggle, it sort of says, oh, right. Like, a teacher can say, yeah, me too. Like I see that as well in my classroom. And so even vehicles like podcasting or when you did the Metametrics Research Roundup, like those are the things that I think ground kind of provides like this human aspect, right? Of not necessarily operationalizing research concepts, but humanizing them in the way that makes sense in the classroom. And I do yeah. want to talk about your work at LMNO and Metametrics and some of the things that you have done to innovate this and connect science and story. Um, But let's even think just globally about this research to practice gap. And on read and in my own professional work, actually, even in my doctorate work, I focus a lot on improvement science. So it's taking the needs assessment, identifying a problem of practice and 
kind of uh, researching different types of interventions and testing them and seeing what happens and collecting data in your context. I see similarities with implementation science, particularly being increasingly adopted in education sciences to ultimately provide educational interventions and not even interventions, but programs and practices that are ultimately going to best serve students at and teachers at scale. And so I see some movement in that area. But for you, how would you evaluate this current state of research to practice? Like what is going well in terms of maybe some facilitators and what might be some barriers that are contributing to this persistent gap? Yes. So I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to be annoying and go back to something real quick. You said about, I, first of all, I love the phrase connecting science and story. I think that's really great. And you use the word interface. And I've been thinking about that a lot. Like how do we interface with research? And I came across this great, I forget if it was a blog or a video about how Steve Jobs was talking about how people interface with something as scary as like a desktop computer. And to show that it wasn't scary, I think there was a commercial or something and they had a handle on it and he threw it out the window, right? So smartphones had been around for a while, but they, Apple changed the way people interface with it, right? Mm -hmm. That intuitive design. And so that's something I've been thinking a lot about with something as scary as like a complex research paper. Mm -hmm. Think about the vocab, the stats, like everything in it. It's like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to read that. Just how do I, so how do you, we fix that interface. And I think there's a lot of interesting things we can do there. So, okay. So that's, that's my, what I wanted to say about that, but barriers to access implementation science, what are things that are going well? So I'm going to be a little bit, because this is my, this is just who I am and my personality. I, I don't think um, it's going well. I think we're actually, it's going pretty badly in terms of bridging the research to practice gap. And I think Solda story really highlighted that, that we can't, that even, and this is an important point. It's not just teachers who are, are not getting the information. It's also product developers and curriculum designers. Mm-hmm. And they, they were hopefully trying to do good. I don't think it was like on purpose. I think some people would argue with that statement, but In my mind, it's like, I think if they had the knowledge out there, they would want, you know, to have designed the best, the most research-based, evidence-based program that they could have. And so I think there's many ways to translate research to practice. Building products or tools is one of them. And so we also need to be thinking about product developers and programs out there, ed tech companies that are doing this and making sure they're getting the knowledge and also doing it. Um, so that's one way to translate research to practice is through a product, like mm-hmm. incorporating it into a product. And we can talk about, you know, the decoding measure in a second, because that's something I did at a, in a very small way in a, in a small scale. But then we can also talk about just accessing research and understanding. And they, those are the kind of four things, or sorry, it might be five or six, actually, that I talked about in my reading league talk that you were at. And that is something I should say at the outset, though, and my thinking is changing on this. I, it's not, not, you know, 180 swings, but just kind of like kind of congealing in a certain era. I do not think teachers, it should be the teachers. I don't think they should be the ones going, searching out journals, trying to read it, trying to synthesize it. There needs to be a better system in place. It is not on their shoulders to be doing that. And I, I don't think that's reasonable, sustainable. In fact, I think we have pretty good systems, scalable systems in place for conducting and sort of disseminating research. If you think about the peer review process, which has been around for several hundred years, it's not perfect by any means. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great articles on, you know, what are, what's the future of the peer review process, but scientists, you know, have all agreed on it, but then we don't have the equivalent for translating that knowledge base that we have. And I think the most, the best example that we have, and people might disagree, maybe there's a better one, but the one that I look to is the field of medicine. They're in the same boat, right? They have a lot of research and then they have to treat patients on a daily basis. And they have two key components that I see that education is missing. First, they have 
training. So they have really intensive training in med school and understanding research and its limitations. And then they have ongoing systems. So commercial apps. And I talked about this as well in the reading league, things like up to date um, to disseminate new research as it comes out. So this intensive training plus the system of sort of updating doctors to make sure they have the best evidence-based information. Mm -hmm. Now in the field of education, we don't even have the first part. We know there's a recent report that came out that showed that I think on the syllabi of, you know, several, you know, many different teacher prep programs were failing. They weren't teaching um, teachers what they needed to know. Right. And then we have no sort of system to update teachers once they've left their teacher prep program. Right. So I don't know. I think I think that's why I say it's going pretty badly. I think there's pockets. I think that it's cool. Social media is great. I see researchers, you know, posting their papers on there, which is nice that they are, you know, they feel they have a voice, but that's not sy systematic, right? It's up to them whether they want to post or not. And it's also not synthesizing the full research. It's just one paper. Yeah. And, you know, I'm guilty of this too. Like the reading research recap is great for alerting people, but it's by no means a, you know, what should be like a perfect system. In drawing on a lot of work that I've done or I've seen and researched in change, actually, in a paper I just read about reading reform, I think it was Cohen and I'll have it on the read podcast. Cohen and hit a co-author in 2017 that one of the aspects of, of successful reading reform was providing the tools and resources to actually implement the reform, right? Yeah. Doesn't seem that you know, overwhelmingly brilliant. I mean, it is brilliant, right? But it's it seems like intuitive, right? That you should it provide does. the tools and resources. Right. And so when you talked about product design, I I, I want to talk, I want to see how you bridge product design and access to research. And so I want to draw back on your work on LMNO and metametrics. And I think that was an important case study and in innovation and in how we facilitate research to practice. So can you walk us through the process or the components that you consider to ensuring that research was ultimately translating in a way that research that educators understood and ultimately benefited their practice? Sure. And I can't speak broadly about how it should be done because I just know I can speak to what happened and what I've learned. And it's a fun kind of case study for me to talk about because I did learn so much throughout the process. And so it started with this kernel of an idea in my doctoral program. You know, my advisor, Lori Cutting, she had this idea. It's like we have all these great measures or formulas for text that's more complex and even Lexiles, right? Market leaders, grades three through eight. But what about this early, these early grades, K through two, what do we have for decodability? We know it's so important for kids to have that practice in the right text early on. And she had young sons at the time. And I was like, that sounds really interesting. That's a project I'd love to work on. So, and so what we did, and what's really cool, you talk about, you know, how do we make sure there's research behind it? Well, we did a large lit review and we'd known about, you know, decoding so important and phonics from the research, but also we had data from her lab to test out or validate these different models or formulas we were coming up with. And so that was a really key part. It's like we could come up with different variables in this decoding measure, but for based on theory, right? So you you scan the literature, you do your lit review, and theoretically, you know, the length of the word, it should be important, right? So, okay, let's put that in. Let's, let's check it out. Does it actually predict students' oral reading errors and what types of errors they're making? And so through that process of theory and then refining it using data, you come up with a model that's, you know, pretty powerful, but still has components that make sense. And I think that's really important because if you don't understand what's going in the model and you can't change that, then it's not going to, it's not going to be useful, right? Mm -hmm. So all these models, there's a great quote by a statistician, I think his name is George Box, that goes, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And all models are wrong because they're simplifications of reality, right? You're never going to have every variable that's important for decoding for every child in your model. So right. you simplify it to the most important ones. But what makes it useful for a product is really important. And there's more on that because so we came up with these models. Vanderbilt filed a patent 
And years later, you know, I was out of Vanderbilt by that time, but we fought for it. You know, most they get rejected on all these different grounds and you fight slowly and you overcome each one of them. And it was, just, it was an exciting process. But basically the it what we developed wasn't ultimately what turned into Lexile Find a Decodable Book. And so after we'd gotten some initial leads from some pretty large um, educational companies, but those deals never went through for various reasons. And I'm not privy to all the details, but I was like, we're getting interest. Why don't I see what I can do with this? And so I was encouraged through the technology transfer office to take an entrepreneurship course, my like second to last year in my doc program. And I did. And at first I hated it. I actually quit midway and then came back after around Christmas break. I was like, this is so foreign, so difficult. Yeah. And I just wanted to give up. But then I, when I stuck it out after grad, after the final presentation, I was like, and the course was centered on how do you take research and write like an SBIR grant or STTR grant, which is known as like the government seed fund mm -hmm. and translate research into a product. And so after our final presentations, I remember thinking like, I can't stop thinking about this. This is the most exciting thing that's kind of ever happened. And I and I was like, I could go into academia or I could take this risk and kind of start my own company. And I was like, I have to, I have to honor these feelings that I'm having that this is like so exciting. And so I decided not to go into academia and started LMNO when we moved to Raleigh. And going back to this idea of what we developed. So I spent those two years at LMNO just talking and building prototypes. So talking to so many teachers, product managers, parents, literacy tutors, um, decodable book publishers or authors, um, and just getting feedback. Like, what would you, is this useful? And it turns out it wasn't useful. They did not want that formula. They didn't want that single number. They wanted to know the letter sounds that were in the book. So I started developing some new prototypes and new measures that were matching students to text based on the letters in letter sounds in the book that a teacher had taught. Mm -hmm. And so that's ultimately what Metametrics was interested in. And we built that out within their own capabilities at Metametrics to build Excel Find a Decodable Book. Dr. Saha, you have offered so much about how educators can be much more knowledgeable consumers of research. And we, in this last clip, we talked about social media, you know, the benefits, the cautions of it. For me, sometimes I feel like maybe I'm a little too cautious about social media, but I do see the opportunities of it. I mean, I think I'm an example of someone who leveraged when it was Twitter back in the day of being able to actually directly talk to researchers. And I love when researchers might will offer commentary or disseminate papers. But sometimes the reason why I say it's caution is because there's so many nuances as a practices that can't be summarized in like a 60 second YouTube short, for example, although maybe if you had a series, maybe that would be good. But I think what I'm getting to is my question is there is such a value in sharing information directly through things like social media, newsletters and things like that. But I, I see this sometimes as like a window or a spark, right? And so when teachers see something and they say, oh, I want to learn more about that. What are those resources or directions they can take to be more proactive consumers of this research and taking this information and using it in their classroom? Yeah, it's a great question. And there's so much to unpack within it. I should start out by kind of laying this groundwork that I don't think we have fantastic resources yet. I think we can get there, but I don't think there's one, you know, oh, I would point teachers to this or to that. I think journal articles at this point, like that is too much to ask teachers to go and find the original research and be able to understand and consume that. It's just too much. There are some good practitioner journals. So the reading teacher is the one that comes to mind. There's a few other ones that are geared towards practitioners. And what they do is they kind of synthesize the research or they have viewpoint articles where they will, you know, take research their own sort of a group of authors or researchers will synthesize the research in terms of classroom practical classroom applications so those are good the reading league has a great journal as well i think it comes out three times a year and i subscribe to that so i read those again that translate the research um 
I wish there were more articles and, you know, resources that kind of gave a status update across, you know, kind of takes like the national reading panel and does like an update on these key hot topics across those pillars or maybe across, you know, 10 to 15 different subjects, maybe not as, you know, as condensed as the five that they go through and just say, here's what came out this year. You know, here's what we still don't know. Here's what we're researching just to give that sort of annual, you know, like level the playing field of here's what we know, what we don't know. I think that would be an amazing resource. I don't know why that hasn't been done, you know, organized by topic just so we can see, you know, the main um, papers that have come out on it and especially focusing on meta-analyses or systematic literature reviews and getting to those specific classroom um, sort of practical implications. How do we do that? And that's very tricky because i um, going on a little bit of a tangent here, but there's no standardized way of presenting the results in a paper and what that means for the classroom. The vagueness, the ambiguity in language, you know, is on the one hand a pro, it's, it's a plus, but it's also a con when it comes to what exactly does this mean? Because if there's ambiguity in how we translate to the classroom, that's going to be a problem. Another issue is that researchers, when they're writing that sort of classroom implications part, many researchers haven't been teachers. Many have, but many also have not. So maybe this is something like the on the it's a burden or an onus that the um, publishers take on. And maybe they have researchers sit down with teachers and have them ask questions, be like, can I do this based on these results? Can I do this? Or are you saying, suggesting this in my classroom? Something like that, some sort of back and forth in the classroom implications part, instead of just the one-sided researcher saying this might be possible. But again, back to the main point, we don't have like a great system or one resource for um I love that. Actually, my eyes lit up because I was like, oh, my gosh, what a great way. Again, this entrepreneurial look of saying, OK, you know, I think that there's a great system, for example, of, of fidelity of implementation. Right. I remember when I was doing my doctorate work, I had a list of questions to think about. Right. And frameworks like theories of treatments and logic models to to. Um, think through that and to communicate that. Mm -hmm. But we almost need some sort of like logic model or theory of treatment for then translation. And it's yes. almost, I mean, it, and I guess maybe I'm talking about my bias as a teacher because I, I already have that classroom experience. So maybe I'm already, I have those two hats, right? But as a, as a researcher, maybe there needs to be something a little more explicit, like you said, of like, okay, here's the logic model. Here's how it might work. And here's maybe how, what we don't know. Is that yeah. what you're sort of getting at? Yeah, exactly. Well, when you say like a logic model, that's similar to what I'm saying, like a system. We don't have a systematic way of approaching the classroom implications part. It's all just kind of like the Wild West out there in terms of that. We have systems for getting grants, um, conducting research, IRB approvals for the whole part of like the research part. But then when it comes to this translation of knowledge after you've left, you know, your training program, how do we keep teachers updated, right? And not just, and I'm not talking about the end research part where you're in a classroom and like fidelity of implementation, right? I'm talking about like, how do we take new knowledge maybe that they've never been, they weren't part of that study and we don't have a great system for that. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I like that. And you talked about a couple of papers. Um, the one we had, you and I had spoken about um, offline was the 20, yeah. 2021 Petcher and colleagues paper, how the science of reading informs the 21st century education. I the thought fantastic. that was one example. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. Because they outlined so much of what we know and further questions like, you know, I think they were one of the first papers I read to think, oh, right, like, what is it that we need to explore more about comprehension, for mm -hmm. example? And it sort of led me down that path of an FCRR when they're doing a lot of work of like whole child work, like Petcher, Dr. Petcher is doing. And I can keep going down a tangent, but I'll stop there. But I think that's <laughs> a one example where we see them synthesizing, right? Yeah, that is fantastic. Like, take that model. I don't, you know, I don't want to put more on their plate, but what what if they did that every year and maybe expanded yeah. the topics and we got like a status update on, you know, what do we know? What do we not know? I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. So they should yeah. start a journal. They should start a journal and just have right. like an update, a synthesis, an annual review of what we know, what we don't know. 
Well, I think also that speaks to reading research recap, right? And some of the work mm-hmm. that you've been doing and taking a certain number of studies and saying, you know, here are the implications. Um, here's where, you know, here where, where you can go in your classroom and here's what I'm interested in. And is that sort of the, uh, yeah. that was sort of like your inspiration? Exactly. Now. It was. And what I do though, that I think is slightly different than what we were just talking about is I pick a paper that come, you know, I'm dependent on what comes out. Whereas mm-hmm. I think they should do that even if no cool papers come out, right? Yeah, like we yeah. should just, what it's a whole, com- it's cumulative and it's comprehensive, I think is more the word I'm talking about. Whereas mine, it's just like focusing on that one. And if there's no interesting, great papers on comprehension, then I won't cover it. But they, I think, or whoever does take on that, you know, annual review should still say, okay, there wasn't anything, you know, interesting or new here. And that's important right. to see. So yeah, covering both yeah. ends. I love that. So you, I think you did touch on cumulative and structuring research that it's cumulative, that it's comprehensive. Um, how do you also see that as explaining anomalies or are there other methods that we could do to say, hey, like this worked for most kids, this probably, this might not work for this certain subset of the population? Yeah. And so this is where science gets so nuanced and complex. And I think we can do a better job of incorporating um, single case research design. And the name's a little bit misleading because single case doesn't necessarily mean on one single person. You can have, you know, five to 10 in, in one study and you can also, you know, include more if you want, you can expand the study. But it the focus is on looking at individual variation. And so I'm a big proponent. I've talked about this in the reading research recap and elsewhere as well of combining this like idea of group design with single case research design Mm. and seeing how we can really get at what works for whom and when. Like, I think we're finally moving to this idea of, you know, personal, like data techniques and, you know, compute power. Like we can finally analyze this data, you know, large quantities of data within a person across time. Mm. And I think you know, we might be able to get, especially also, you know, I'm going on tangent now with like game, like apps and um, games, educational ed tech that can collect this sort of nuanced data and maybe A, B test within a person and see, you know, all right, this student needs these explicit decoding rules. Whereas this one's kind of, you know, picking up on the statistical regularities a little bit more quickly without that. And the rules just kind of overwhelm them in a way. You know, I I feel like we could figure out by individual, eventually, maybe this is a pipe dream. I think down the road, we can get there. Right now, um, I think it's hard because most studies are group design. And we seem to also place a lot of weight on group design studies and then meta-analyses of those group design studies. And when you're doing a meta-analysis, it's like even one layer removed from that data from those, because the, the, the population are studies at that point, not individuals. So to figure out if something's applicable to your classroom as a teacher, you want to find that meta-analysis, look at the individual studies, and then go back and check the populations of those and make sure they're kind of similar to your students. Look at the demographic information, you know, and just check because that's, you know, not everything works for all these, for every student, right? There's going to be variation. And I think, I mean, I'm a mom and I think parents or anyone who's worked with young kids knows this, like kids are so different. Um, Siblings are even different. So to figure out and optimize that learning um, is going to be important. And that's also something, sorry, talking a lot here. (laughs) Feel free to cut this. this. (laughs) With like AI tutors now and like individualization and figuring out, I'm seeing a lot of cool stuff that can happen. So optimistic in this area. I think this even just, you made an important point is that recognizing that all, that kids are different, right? And that, remember when I was teaching, I did a fifth grade class, um, and they all had either some sort of language-based learning disability or were diagnosed with dyslexia. And mm-hmm. um, their our, their decoding needs were pretty similar, but the mm-hmm. language needs and the processing wow. and the working memory needs were so diverse that it took, you know, at the baseline, this like super metacognitive awareness of student A needing certain, even just like a a certain amount of wait time versus student B may have needed the same amount of wait time, but it was because student B just wanted to blurt out everything in their mind without, you know, taking the time to, for them to process versus student A actually like having really low pro like 
you know, really high yeah. needs in processing time, right? They had a really low processing Teachers speed. Teachers so, see this all the time. And that's mm-hmm. so difficult. Can you imagine classroom management with like those different students? It's so yeah. hard and making sure that they all get the opportunities to respond. So I definitely think this is an area where technology can help out too. Yeah. I love those points. And I think I want to um, circle back when we talked about translating research to practice and not putting the onus on teachers. And um, I earlier in the episode, I had mentioned Emily Solari's 74 million um, article, the 2020 article, where she talks about pushing these multiple levers. Um, and I think that's so pertinent um, as I think about policy change that is enacted, right? I mean, recently, I think it was December or early January, the Governor Hochul signed the Dyslexia Task Force Bill, and we're seeing a lot of literacy bills being pushed out across the co- the country. And so where I'm going with that is that multiple levers need to be pushed and that there needs to be this comprehensive systems change from research to policy. It's one that we talk, that we think a lot about in professional development at the WI, right, of taking research, like practices that are grounded in research and making them effective, efficient, and feasible. So I think my question for you, and this will be our last question of this, of a, of our second scene of the Read podcast, is as a researcher, what are you, what are you looking for from those, those different levels, from policy, from even district leaders, from teacher prep or PD programs that they could be more effective in ensuring that the onus isn't on teachers to translate and apply it to their classrooms? Yeah, well, first of all, it's a great point to bring up. And I'm going to kind of bow out of this question a little bit because I don't know if I am qualified enough to actually speak at the level of systems change. I don't have direct experience in it. However, I would say I just came across a really fascinating paper. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to feature it actually, I think in a couple months here for the reading research recap about a theory of professional development, you know, which, what makes a one professional development program more effective than another. And that's what these researchers, you know, they put forward a theory. I don't, I can't repeat it because I haven't read it yet. I don't know what it is. And then they test it and they look at data and see, you know, which ones were more effective. Because I definitely think we need that. Not all PD is created equal. And if you are um, in district or like an admin, right, you don't want just any PD. You want evidence of effectiveness, just like you would for a program that you use for your students. And so what makes something more effective versus not, I think is something we need to also like codify, systematize, and make it sort of transparent. Um, it's definitely necessary. I don't. I think we're in the beginning stages of that. That's why my eyes lit up when I saw that paper because it's like, yeah. ah, this is what we need. Everyone is putting out PD right now. It's so right. hot, especially given the uptake of letters. But like, mm-hmm. what you know is that translating to student gains? And I think in some papers we're starting to see that it's it's yeah. a stretch, right, to make sure and and to expect that within one year of like training teachers, which are the studies I've seen take place in a year. But we are seeing evidence that it does help, you know, improve student outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, So which variables or which components of that PD especially are effective? So kind of a non-answer, but I think we'll get there. Um, I know you said this was the last question, but I do have this interesting tangent that I want to share about implementation fidelity, which I thought was great. And I might have to um, dig up a paper and come back to you on this. But when I was in my maybe first or second year at my doc program at Vanderbilt, Doug Fuke, so big name, big researcher in the field with RTI response to intervention and MTSS, he gave this, you know, just kind of a local, you know, on campus talk about implementation fidelity. And I believe it was a study he was involved in. So he starts his talk talking about Starbucks, about how they ran a study about whether they should give these sort of like top down from corporate headquarter rules or for store design. I think it was design or something about processes or design of the stores, or should they let them adapt them to local needs? And they found out that when they were adapting them to local needs, like the stores were kind of in charge of themselves rather than this top down, it was actually um, better. Like I, I'm assuming the outcome measure was like profits or some like satisfaction. But then he segued into his data on this where they were looking at, you know, I think it was their PALS program. Like when you implement it, do teachers have to be completely scripted in order to have the best student outcomes? Or is there some sort of, can you give leeway in certain areas, right? There's certain things we want to cover as teachers we know are super important, right? Explicit decoding and phonics is important to teach. But in certain areas, 
if we give teachers that agency, and I believe that was the condition that was um, better. So I need to dig up this research, but I found that so interesting because it's like teachers just don't want completely scripted stuff. You know, if there's a way that they can infuse their own age, they know their students the best. So if they can adapt that curriculum in a way in certain areas, maybe I find I just that study sticks with me. It's just so fascinating. And I think we're also seeing that model across different areas, like our local Barnes and Nobles now completely redid it. And there's a lot more local store autonomy. It is a hundred times better. Even my husband was saying he feels guilty buying books on Amazon now because when you go into the store, it's such a wonderful experience. So I just think it's something interesting to keep in mind with classrooms too and teacher autonomy. Yeah. Oh, I love when you brought that in. I reminded of a paper I'd written. Now I have to not write. I didn't write it. I read um, right. about the importance of, of a teacher agency and PD and translating oh, to um, student outcomes. I think the author said something like PD fails when it fails to address teacher agency. But I think loosely related to your point, right, is that, you know, yeah, really they're, they're, it's not like the teacher's not going to take this package program and adopt it like verbatim, right? And that yeah. because that that teacher is an expert in the room, right? You're giving them the tools to do that. But you know, yeah. they know their students best, right? And there's also this, so many other variables, like relational aspects and trust, right? Like yeah, you can't have exactly. someone delivering it robotically when right. you have humans in front of you and a human delivery. Yeah, it. so I more love testing, that point. I think, in that, in that area of like, where can we allow for more agency or not? And it brings up also this point of like, you know, Fountas and Pinnell and some of those programs that were shown not to be evidence-based or effective, but they made the teacher feel, you know, valued, powerful, that autonomous, and they had that own sense of agency. So we need obviously evidence based, but also you can't forget that human aspect. So yes. final points I always like to add with, um, or I guess final question is what are your hopes for the future? And I think I like to to put out calls into the not only the read universe, but in the education universe of uh, uh, um at large about where we see the future of education and translation of research and education going. So can you leave us with a few hopes or calls for the future on this, other than what you've already offered, on what the translation of research and practice should be, um, what should we be focusing on, especially in this new year? Yeah, well, I think a lot of the things I, my hopes are that we address some of those, the things we talked about, right? So I know that good work's being done at getting teacher credentialing programs um, to incorporate more evidence-based practices and teach teachers. So like that's the one part in that sort of medical model. We know that doctors have that extensive training. But the part that's really exciting is my hope is that there will be a scalable, systematic, um, consensus building way of translating research to practice. So this implementation science, I hope that we at least can solve some of those problems, maybe not all in the next, you know, like three to five years. I mean, these are not intractable problems. Like we know we can get information out there, but then there's, you know, we can, it'll take work and effort, but I'm sure we can get researchers to at least even, you know, do that bullseye thing. Like where would you place this fact, right? A teacher has this question, is this evidence enough to support it? And just, you know, Mark, that's very simple technology we can use. It's just, you know, corralling all the re enough researchers to kind of get a feeling on this. Um, we can we can make that scalable as well. But I do think it's important that we start having more teacher voices in the research that gets done. Mm -hmm. So something that I like to see on LinkedIn, you know, when it's when people put up that like open to work. Well, I think that's really cool because it's like, you know, I wonder if we can't create something like that, like a platform where there's researchers and teachers and, you know, teachers could say like open, because I know a problem having been in research is fostering those um, university and school relationships and getting in classrooms can be really intimidating for researchers. Right. So if there's teachers who are like willing to, you know, like, look, we'll participate in the research. Here's a question I have. Can we focus on this question and try and explore it? It's just making better bridges um, for making that easier, making it having less friction in that sort of back and forth. So things yeah. like that. Yeah. 
Oh, I love that. That's so good. As I, I don't know if you know this, but Windward is one of two schools working with Yale right now. Uh, nice. We have EEG in school neuroscience lab. And so as a teacher, that's it's amazing. So, yeah, it is so empowering to see, you know, that as a teacher, I can be a designer of my student instruction, right? Um, yes. Because this is being validated by the research and that to participate and talk with researchers has been such a unique opportunity that I never thought I'd be able to get. And so That's I know that there's, cool. yeah, there's a number of universities, FCRR and Vanderbilt and others that are, that are MGH right. Institute does a lot of work with that. So I like that call because I think there's much more opportunity for that. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine if we can get like all universities that have like that school, you know, there's just a lot more stuff that can be done. Yeah. I know there are, you, Vanderbilt did have like a lab school, I think on site too, Yeah, um, but also Metro Nashville. There were some researchers that were better than others at getting in the schools too. So, right. um, but I'm just, yeah, I, I'm really, one of the things with um, why I love up to date is that the doctor who he founded it on this sort of core principle of what are the clinical questions that doctors have? He didn't start with like, what's the research out there? He's like, what are the questions that they have to answer on a daily basis? And like, that's what I think we need to focus on. Like, what are these burning questions that teachers have? Then let's examine the research, right? Let's not just start and just, you know, let's synthesize what we have out there. So I think it's really important that we start paying attention to and validating teachers' questions and needs and concerns. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Dr. Saha, at the end of the podcast, we always say until next time readers. And I've been asking the guests to say it as the final close off because it's, you know, it's a lot of fun for you to have the final word. So would you like to do our final send off? Sure. Until next time readers, 